At the policy level, fair and effective educational evaluation is the foundational element for other reforms being considered for our schools, including legislative proposals to modify our current tenure and seniority laws and proposals for merit-based systems. <coughs> Pay systems. I know that these issues are on the mind of every school leader in this room and even those not in this room. It is my pleasure to introduce a real highlight of today's agenda, our legislative panel discussion. Today we are fortunate to have a panel of key leaders and decision makers on these complex issues with us, along with John Mooney of NJ Spotlight. NJ Spotlight is a nonpartisan, independent <coughs> online news service providing insight and information on issues critical to New Jersey. John has covered education in New Jersey for 15 years as a reporter for the New York Star-Ledger and the Bergen Record, and recently as a contributing writer for the New York Times. He has won numerous state and national awards, including honors from the Education Writers Association and the American Society of News Editors. John will introduce our panelists. We have more detailed uh, agendas uh, in your folders this morning. And as the morning uh, progresses during our panel discussions, there are yellow note cards um, at each table. If you have a question, uh, jot down the question and wave down a PSA staff member, and we'll collect those for uh, questions for our panel. So it's my pleasure to introduce John. Thank you, everyone. Last act of your morning. Thank you for, for hanging in. Um, so not not really a quiet time for education, is it, uh, these days? And, and I, I wonder if it ever will be again. I remember when I first got into education journalism, it was a, a feature beat, and we did classroom, you know, nice little happy stories, and, and it has evolved a, a great deal in the last 20 years. And Now, I'm not complaining. It's helping keep NJ Spotlight in business, so uh, I got no problem with that. But it's obviously a lot to grasp at once, and, and uh, I appreciate these kinds of sessions that allow us to delve into some of the topics. Um, we're not going to discuss everything on the agenda uh, for education. Uh, we're not going to talk so much about school funding, charters, vouchers, uh, favorite topic, bullying policy, I'm sure. Uh, those things will not be part of the discussion, but we are going to talk about educator effectiveness and, and what the legislature's role is in setting the law and policy uh, on that. Um, and we have before us really some of the key legislators uh, at the center of the debate, and really um, some of the central players who, who are going to shape and, and in, in large part how this how this is going to turn out in the next couple of years. Now we mentioned a couple of ground rules uh, in terms of if you have questions, write them down, and they will sort of wind their way up to me, and I'll try to incorporate them into the discussion. Uh, we hopefully, if we have some time at the end of this, we'll be able to do some Q and A uh, directly from the microphones as well. So um, uh, hopefully in the last ten minutes or so. Basically, I'd like to split the discussion a little bit into a couple categories, one being uh, first the teacher evaluation piece and the pilot uh, and how that is shaping up and, and again, the, the legislators uh, impressions and, and how they can steer that in their, own, in their own bills and then also the tenure bill and, and tenure reform and different approaches to that and, and points of view. Um, I guess I, let's get going. I, I'm going to open with the first question and as, as we go, I will introduce uh, our, our panelists. But first question, uh, you know, we're, we're, we have new tests coming online, uh, we have a new data system that's, that's being rolled out, new accountability for schools, uh, a tenure bill, a couple tenure bills, maybe three or four tenure bills, and evaluation pilots going on. I'd like to ask the legislators, um, what, what is their priority? Uh, what, what do we need to get first right? Or get right first, I'm sorry. Um, and, you know, where you know, where is really the rubber hitting the road on this? And I'm going to start with uh, Senator Teresa Ruiz. Uh, she is the chairperson of the Senate Education Committee and, and probably the lead player on the Senate, certainly the lead player on the Senate side in terms of the tenure reform bill. It is hers, and she's been working on it for the better part of a year. But let's start with you, Senator. Speak to what your priority is in, in dealing with educator effectiveness. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. And sorry that I wasn't here for um, this morning's part of the program, but. I speedily, in, within law, came on the term I got here on time. I um, first to note that John said uh, that you know education hasn't quieted. To me, education should never be quiet. I mean, we should be talking about it on every 
every moment that we have to engage. And I think that the most positive dynamic that has occurred here in the state and nationally is that around um, <coughs> tables across any corner, whether you're in the kitchen, whether you're in a library, whether you're talking to dis <coughs> different practitioners, that we're all talking about the most critical thing, and that's education, where we're going, where we're at, and where do we need to move. Um, it's obvious by the efforts that I put forward that currently my main focus is ensuring that we have the best practitioners in front of the classroom. And what does that mean? Not in a negative sense, not giving anybody an opportunity or a tool to go in and just weed out, but to really engage the profession in a way where we can mark where a person is at, what are the resources critically needed to support um, those deficiencies, to move from good to great and to move from okay to much better. And, uh, you know, there are many moving pieces and many moving parts, but it is clear that there is a lot that New Jersey has to accomplish, both from in-classroom standards to teacher professional development and improvement plans to quality to school construction to universal preschool. But the one element that we do find is, um, or that I've seen, when we have phenomenal principals and, uh, in a school building, you will oftentimes have a great school. And when that person is given um, the opportunity to assemble their key core staff, that uh, you see that benefit and you see that positive growth of what happens within the school building. And that one thing that you can witness across the way is that when our children are exposed to a professional that is um, greatly developed and, and has the resources that they need to do their job well, that the outcomes are phenomenal. And that's where my focus is right now. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Next up, Assemblyman Patrick Dignan. Uh, Democrat, 18th District. He's chairman of the Assembly Education Committee, um, also a prime sponsor of legislation in that chamber uh, to streamline the tenure hearing process. Uh, Senator. Thanks, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for all you do. Uh, one of the biggest challenges happening in New Jersey right now is the lack of coverage of so many of these issues that are going on. NJN has been replaced by something that I don't even know what it is anymore. Uh, our local newspapers are going out of business. This, and I'm, I'm not blowing smoke because he comes here to me more than he compliments me, but, but he really is right now a prime uh, individual to get the word out concerning the education in the state of New Jersey. Thank you for it. I did not pay him to say that. And, that's <laughs> where, and let me tell you something else about John. It's 24 7. He'll bug you anytime. You <laughs> Once you get yourself on your hook. Uh, but anyhow, that being said, I come from a different community. I truly believe that New Jersey's education system, K through 12, is one of the best in the nation. And for some reason, starting with a little over two years ago, there was an event that took place where there a, uh, an individual is trying to convince us that we have an awful education system. I, I kind of sometimes refer to it as the Vietnam policy. Remember that famous quote, we had to destroy the village in order to save it? I don't really buy that. Do we have some uh, changes that need to be done? Absolutely positively. My prime focus is to basically expedite the process uh, to expeditiously remove non-performing teachers from the classroom. But you as principals and administrators know, you can identify with pretty good certainty a non-performing teacher and the, non and the other teachers in the building don't want a non-performing teacher amongst them because it makes their job harder. Uh, so many of the magic bullets that people are looking for simply don't exist. This, this putting a basis on tenure on test scores to me, we can't even track graduation rates. Have you checked that one? Did any of you have the situation where they didn't know who was on the Board of Education when, they, when the, the new mandate for the criminal background checks? The Department of Education did not have a reliable database as to who was on the boards of education in the state of, in the state of New Jersey. So if, if you ask me one word, what am I looking for? Consensus. The folks in this room know more about education than all of us on this panel combined. Teachers know more about education than anyone on this panel combined. We have got to sit down, and I've spoken to a lot of folks this morning before we started, and talk and come up with a plan that is going to stop dividing educators and start uniting educators. And that's my goal. And I mean, I've said to a lot of folks here this morning, before I drop my bill, 
I'll be certain to share it with you first. Let's, and, we, and we're not going to solve all these issues in one day. It's going to have to be done incrementally. And if we try and take this on all at once, you know, to, to impose test scores as a determining factor where we don't even have a, a reliable test score database, that would, in my mind, be a big mistake. So my goal, one word, is consensus. I think we can do it. John was saying it last year. The question was, uh, do I think we're going to have tenure reform? And I said, no. This year, I think the answer is yes. I think we will. And I'm going to compliment Senator Ruiz for taking the lead on this. I know she's taken a lot of hate from a lot of different groups, but she started the discussion. At least it's a starting point. And I think we're going to, I think we're going to reach consensus, and I think we're all going to be better off. I'm, I'm an optimist by nature. But all of, all of you have to be part of the solution. All of you have to be part of the solution. Thank you, Pat. Uh, next, uh, Assemblyman David Wolf, a Republican from the 10th yeah. District, a longtime member of the uh, Assembly Education Committee and former chairman of the committee, as well as a college professor. Again, the question, what, do you, what is your priority? Uh, what, what do you feel we need to get right first uh, before all else? Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I want to say a few things which may be slightly different than you've heard previously. First of all, I want to thank your organization, especially Debbie Bradley. Debbie and your organization, you may not know that, worked diligently with all of us up here at the Assembly to pass a rather stringent dating violence bill. It was signed by the governor this past May. Uh, but I'm very dismayed to find out that not too much has been done by the Department of Education to see that that gets into the, into the classroom next year. So that's, that's one of my problems right here. As a legislator, trying to work on policy, passing on, and kind of getting lost in the black hole. So but, and I, we'll move on to my next issue. John, what Pat said is very, very true. Uh, with, with the Gannett newspapers taking over most of the local uh, media in, in the state in terms of print, uh, we're left with very few uh, in, information sources that really come down to true issues. And I do believe that, that uh, John's uh, paper and his, his columns really uh, allow most people who are, I was in education to know really what's going on and what's coming down the pike. And that's really what I want to talk about, coming down the pike. Um, most of us up here, uh, while we may be, well, I'll suppose like, they may be Democrats, I'm Republican, um, don't have uh, a lot of philosophical differences in terms of approaches to education. Uh, how it gets done might be a little bit different. But I, I have basically two concerns. Um, I was a professor for a number of years. I was, I was an administrator in college, and all my experiences have been in college. Uh, my mom was a teacher, my great aunt was a teacher, my ex-wife was a teacher, my two daughters in law were teachers. Um, but I think the most important thing is really what's going on in the classroom. What tools need to be provided, not only to the teacher, but to the administrators and to the superintendents, to see that for the students in their district, there is an effective education. And that comes back to accountability. You know, it, money's coming to the district, really getting into the classroom. How often have all of us sat on committees and we've heard teachers say they have to buy pencils, they, buy, they have to buy notebooks, they have to buy supplies for the, for the children that they teach. Uh, that should not be the responsibility of the teachers. The money should be provided for uh, people who are there. Um, and I can really reflect on my own experience. Two things that happened I'll never forget. Um, one was uh, an interview with a, uh, elementary, an elementary school in um, Philadelphia about 10 years ago, got a new principal. Uh, it was a, a minority district, it was a failing school, one of the lowest scores in the, in the uh, Philadelphia school district. But the principal got the, the parents involved, got the parents to get paint, to come in and paint in the bathrooms, they paint in the classrooms, they, they clean the windows. Uh, they developed pride in the school. Everybody had a piece of really what was going on. And over the, about three or four years, that school's scores gradually began to increase to the point where they actually were becoming modeled for other districts. And the last thing in terms of my experience as a, as a member of the Education Committee, how many of you remember Senator John Ewing? Okay, he's a very, very interesting gentleman, a uh, long time uh, member of the Senate, still alive, but when, I can recall years ago he organized a bus trip for legislators to really see what was, what was going on in the schools of, of New Jersey. First place we went was the brand new junior high school that was built in Jersey City, the takeover district. Everything was brand new. Then we went to Morris, Morris Town, very affluent district. Everything was not brand new, but it was in pretty good shape. Our last visit was to an elementary school in Camden where we got lost because uh, uh, 
Senator Ewing thought he, he knew where uh, Camden was, and we ended up down by Cape May. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we, we were supposed to be at this, this school in Camden. Oh, I'm going to sort this. We were supposed to be at the school in Camden at 2 o'clock. We got there at 4.30. And I never was in Camden. I was going by to go to Philadelphia. So we, we got off a route. This is 30. We made, we made a left. We went by some buildings, some houses, some factories. And then there was nothing. Probably maybe 10, 10 blocks of nothing, just, just flat. And in the distance, I saw I saw a cyclone fence in the distance. And I realized the cyclone fence was around a building. And as we got closer, I noticed there were cars around the inside, parked by the cyclone fence. And as we got, drove up to it, it was a school. The school was surrounded by a cyclone fence. It was a little nowhere. We got there at 4.30. There must have been 300 parents in that school, this elementary school. And, and I was, and same thing as the Philadelphia experience. These parents got involved. They were excited about what was going on in the school. And those kids did very well. I'll never forget that. But I remember driving away. I wondered, part of my English, where the hell did those kids live? I saw no houses. It was almost like being dropped off at a depot somewhere. And then they get distributed somewhere else. So coming back to what I said originally, I think the most important thing is accountability and enhancing the climate so the people involved in education have the tools they need to be effective. Thank you. Next up, uh, Assemblywoman Pilot J.C., Democrat from the 27th District, uh, a member of the Assembly Education Committee. Uh, in, in addition to a lot of these issues we're talking about today, she has been one of the real leaders in the Assembly in terms of uh, charter school uh, accountability and, and has worked very hard on that. Um, but Myla, again, question your priorities in terms of talking about educator effectiveness. What, what do you feel we need to get right first? That's a tough question. Um, good morning. I came early because I wanted to hear what the Department of Ed members had to say. And I will tell you, and um, the speaker before them, him, them. Um, and I was actually encouraged and heartened by the... Um, the facts, the sincerity, and the real depth of understanding that I thought they all exhibited. So that gave me uh, some cause for hope. What worries me the most, though, is as a former Board of Ed member, as uh, the sister and mother of public school teachers, um, I worry about and talk about these issues all the time with people who are actually on the ground in the buildings working with children. And I know very well that what that decisions that we make in Trenton are too often not informed by the reality of what you are doing every day. So one of the things that concerns me tremendously is this timeline, okay? It is so uh, aggressive that I don't understand how we can possibly believe that it can be done in the time that time frame that is being proposed because it gets me to my second issue, capacity. Um, the capacity to get the work done. I don't think there's any uh, question about the intention of everyone in this room and outside of this room whom you represent. I think we all have the right intention. We all understand that we're at a very critical point in terms of education and reform issues both nationally and here on the state level. But what I worry about is our capacity to actually get the work done because I know very well from my years on the board um, that we have reduced administrative capacity over the last number of years very much. And we know, the research tells us, that um, leadership in the building is absolutely imperative towards um, enabling teachers to do their work and for children to learn. So the last point I would make is that I hope that we can step back, take a breath, get it right by giving everyone the time to do the work, to allow the research to guide the policy decisions, um, because I think that we won't get this opportunity again. And I don't want us to squander this what I see as a very positive opportunity to make changes where changes need to be made throughout the system to benefit children, because that's really where we should be focused. 
Our children really are our future. And if we don't um, act responsibly and deliberately, uh, we'll lose this opportunity. Very good. Thank you. Our last panelist, uh, last but not least, and, and our, 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 our one non-legislator, uh, Dr. Bruce Baker, uh, is a professor at Rutgers Graduate School of Education, uh, a researcher, a lot of it around the numbers of, of education, blogs on the issue, on the issue of education, uh, educator evaluation, as well as other topics. It's, uh, if, if, if it's not in your notes, at School Finance 101, is it? Uh, yeah, at WordPress. At WordPress. School Finance 101 at, uh, at, at WordPress. And it's a wonderful, uh, very smart blog and, and informs a lot of us. Dr. Baker, um, you know, you've, you've heard the legislators speak before you. From your point of view, from an academic and research point of view, what do you feel that New Jersey needs to do first uh, as its top priority in, in dealing with educator effectiveness? Um, I have the benefit of not having uh, not having to run for re-election at any point, not having to actually have a platform. And you have here. tenure, I believe. Do you and, and I do have tenure, um, and I drive to Cape May intentionally. <laughs> so, uh, I'm also uh, formerly I spent I was at the University of Kansas for 11 years before coming back back east. Uh, so I've still got a team in the final four. Uh, that said, I, you know, I, I like a lot of what I'm hearing today. You know, the, the main issue for me, and this is, you know, this is of course the classic kind of academic researcher cop out, but it's that there's a lot that we don't know, and there's a lot that we need to know if we really feel that we are ready and able to do some kind of prescriptive centralized policy. I think it's very problematic to propose highly prescriptive and centralized policies for how schools should operate to become better when we don't really know how well these things are going to work. Now, that, that said, I would give some, a, a lot of credit to the state of New Jersey for moving much more cautiously and more slowly on these issues uh, than, than other states, which really pushed through what I believe to be very ill-conceived, Ill poorly designed policies that are already showing up as, as being very problematic on the ground in schools. Um, so there's, there's a lot that we need to know. There's a lot of kind of nuts and bolts activity that needs to go on so that we can start to learn some of these things we need to know. I mean, I think you, you heard this morning, and I, I'm somewhat aware of timeline issues with the department's responsibilities and technical capacity for getting things done. We're also taking different measurement approaches that I'll you know, come back to at a later point um, that, that need to be studied for you know, certain kind of key issues of reliability and validity. Um, we, you know, this, what I've heard here is that um, this is largely uh, you know, improving school quality and teacher quality is largely a management problem. A, a lot of it falls on principals and supervisors in figuring out how to effectively manage personnel issues. Um, yet, you know, a lot of what's out there in my field are large-scale statistical studies of simply how the different measures of teacher effectiveness vary and what do they correlate with. We aren't doing a lot of deep study these days about the human resource management that occurs among principals and supervisors in working with teachers. Um, and, and that's what we need to be doing. We may want to look at how some of this statistical information plays into these processes, but I would be hard pressed as a researcher to suggest any viable ways to kind of forcibly integrate that information at this point in time. I think there's a heck of a lot that we, uh, that we need to know. I think saying, you know, it's something that a, a number of colleagues and I talk about, that improving teacher quality, equality is not a policy in and of itself. It may be a broad objective, but the policies that are about that deal with much kind of more nitty-gritty nuts and bolts issues, and they are issues that we've not studied in the way that we're framing them in the policy debate right now, be it tenure, merit pay, teacher effectiveness uh, measurement. These are, these are things that we, uh, we really need to figure out better before we try to centralize any control over them across districts. Um, trying to see if I have any other notes uh, that I've done here. I think that's kind of all I have for now because I don't have a, a, a bill on the table or anything. <laughs> but I'm, I'm happy to discuss uh, you know, the details. Well, let me add I mean, you, you raise a You raise a point, and, and I'm curious the legislators' point of view on this as well, is how much should, uh, and let's talk a little bit about teacher evaluation and, and, and principal evaluation for that matter, um, and the pilot that's going on, how much of this should be statutory? 
how much should this be written into law? Um, you know, the number of evaluations that, or number of observations that teachers go through, the pre and post conferences, um, obviously the, the big issue of, of how much student performance uh, fits into that evaluation. How much do you feel that this is the legislature's job? How much do you want to defer to the administration, which, you know, depending on your party, may come with its perils? Um, speak to that. The sentiment diagram. Uh, you're, yeah, I'm going to let you go first. I have your cell phone, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, as little as possible, I think she needs that to do. Um, because I really believe that there should be the ability to deal with <clears throat> I mean, Bernardsville is not candy or Cape May, depending on which way you get there. Um, <laughs> you, know, you folks know that better than anybody else. So, you know, to require three evaluations from every teacher every year in every district, when you as a principal know that, that there are certain teachers that are just outstanding and don't need as much attention as others, I think the more flexibility we can put into this process, the better. That's one of the reasons that I'm so from Missouri uh, when it comes to uh, 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 um, relying so much on test scores. Because, you know, I always use the example. When I was in high school, the best teacher I ever had, his name was Mr. Stern. He was my French teacher. Uh, in fact, Mr. Stern every day used to start off the class by standing up and singing the French national anthem, which I am the vegan for the I we get music in here. He literally inspired me to be a better teacher, a better, a better student, too. I got a C in that. To this very day, chicken called him blue is not the only thing I say properly. But he was an inspiring teacher. So how in the world would the test scores in that particular class be a, a reliable gauge as to his promotion? You know, I know that's anecdotal, but just my life experience. So, you know, I just think we've got to be as flexible as possible and give the department as much flexibility as it needs. If it's abused, then we as the legislature can revisit that. But I think as a starting point, the more flexibility in the process is going Yeah, Senator Ruiz, your tenure bill um, does include some, some broad parameters in terms of the evaluation piece. Speak, speak to what you think is the right balance on this. Yeah, I agree with Assemblyman Dignan. I, I agree with Assemblyman Dignan, and, and that's why we had very broad language. But what we wanted to secure was to create some kind of firewall parameters so that in the event that a future administration would come in and say, we are going to use just this measurement alone, that they would be precluded from doing that. And so within the bill, there are um, very just overarching. Can you um, give a couple examples? To so multiple measures of student growth. So it's not designed, um, and, and the fire, and I, I, I can't recall verbatim, but there is preventative language in there that it cannot be judged based on one test score across the way. And that there would have to be, um, in classroom uh, observations as part of the final summative evaluation piece. And so it was, it's very broad, and I do agree, I don't think that we should statutorily um, create the whole step-by-step -step process, but I think that we also have to be cognizant that we have to um, create some components in there to secure uh, that not one measure gets used solely to, at the end of this evaluation process, and within the bill, it points back to the district itself, so that the district has some say, that DOE will create perhaps a uniform baseline approach, but that the district will have an opportunity to weigh in so that uh, evaluations could look different and will look different based on where you're coming from. Other uh, assemblywoman, JC, do you? I would just make a comment that I'm uh, looking forward to seeing the results of the pilot because uh, for one thing, it's being piloted in the district that I live in and where I served on the board. And I've had the opportunity to talk to uh, teachers and administrators in the district. And they're actually, you know, initially they weren't too happy about it, uh, about the fact that the superintendent volunteered them. Um, but uh, now that they're well into it, that attitude has really changed because I think people realize it's not a gotcha situation. and. Um, speaking off the record, teachers have told me, you know what, this is actually helpful because for once we're finally having real conversations about improving practice 
we're finally having opportunities to talk with our colleagues and share um, within the school and within the district best practices and different approaches because as, it, as has been said several times this morning um, there shouldn't be cookie cutter approaches so again I would say that as a legislator I'm not an educator I don't think it's our role to make those decisions I would rather hear from this organization with whom we have a very good relationship um, and others and be informed by the pilot and find out what are your recommendations what works for you and how much flexibility do you need? Yeah, let me uh, a little self uh, promotion here. NJ Spotlight has, has run and we started last week uh, with a, a round table discussion in this room on uh, following the evaluation pilots and we'll be doing three or four more where we brought in teachers and, and principals from those districts to talk a little bit about their experience and and as uh, the assemblywoman said that was the general impression we got from as well in terms of some trepidation going in uh, teachers in starting to appreciate the discussions that has has spurred but also some, some still some underlying fears about the student performance piece um, so it's been uh, it's early on, and, and as you know, the pilot is now extended into next year, and there'll be a lot more to discuss on that. Dr. Baker, you wanted to add something? I, was, I, was just, I, mean, I think that's the value of approaching it flexibly, and, and you know, more or less as an incentivized pilot program, giving multiple opportunities to try these different things without real tight constraints as to what needs to be embedded in those in those pilots, and then and then studying it um, in part again, because we really don't know what works well, and some of the constraints that we seem to be putting on these plans that cause the most problems that, that we kind of fly past in many of the proposals are saying that we, we must have four or we must have five categories requiring us to put these rigid lines of demarcation between who's good and who's really good uh, through data that are invariably noisy, where you could be almost as likely to be in this category as this category. That's one of these things that we often mess up because we feel like we have to put them into categories. Uh, you know, another thing is we, we don't often think about these. We need, we need to have the flexibility, for example, to not say that this has to be a system of parallel elements weighted differently, that, that we do a weighted average of all of your pieces and 20 or 40 percent is the quantitative growth component and these other percentages of the other things. Because when you put them all parallel to one another, the one that varies most will always be the tipping point. What about you know, the way we do things like you know, screening for strep throat where you have your noisy indicator which tells you perhaps a high likelihood of false positive but more likely right than wrong. You then use that as a, in a stepwise process of them doing further investigation. <coughs> Might quantitative information better guide us in figuring out where to focus our effort in observations but not in and of itself drive decisions. These are kind of different ways to look at this stuff. I've tended to find that the quantitative information isn't really helping me much with that either, but, but that at least we could be thinking differently about how we approach these things, and doing a flexible pilot program allows us to do that, whereas if we mandate that X percent shall be this category in determining the final decision, and that there must be this many categories of performance, we box in those systems in ways that may ultimately force them to collapse down the line. Senator Ruiz, did you? I just, I just it, it was interesting that after, um, so the Senate has held two very long hearings, and after that discussion, and, and I, I see Jennifer shaking her head, and I, and I will take this time to plug Jennifer and, and Debbie. They're often uh, calling and, and, and making sure that I hear the pulse of, of what is echoed um, from all of you. But I, I, I did hear from some stakeholder groups that they wanted the observation piece a little bit more defined so that it wouldn't be loose across the board. And in this opportunity of attempting to create consensus um, to some extent, and I think that's what becomes the most difficult task is that different stakeholders look at things differently through a different lens. And so while we're, you know, we create a flexible uh, structure within the bill, and then we kind of hear that in certain criteria, perhaps not rigorous, but a more um, a built-in framework as to how the objective component of the final evaluation will look like so that not anyone is just doing it based <coughs> on whatever criteria it is that they see fit in an attempt to make it more objective. Senator Wolf? 
It's me, Kate May. Remember that story? <laughs> I'm still here. Um, I, I have a, a little, maybe a little different perspective. I have always um, been challenger of the status quo, whether it's politically or in my neighborhood or in higher education. So uh, I, I think the pilot program is great. I think it's wonderful, and I think as many options as you can consider should be considered. But the real thing is an evaluation. How do you how do you evaluate the success? or failure of the, of the pilot program. And I think the, uh, I would agree with, I think most of us seem to agree that uh, there shouldn't be, uh, you know, mandated certain five or six things which you must do. I think you need to have some kind of flexibility. And I just want to, if we shift from education to taxes, is that okay? Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Uh, I'll come back Senator back. Sweeney, two or three years, two years ago, introduced a bill that uh, had a countywide tax assessing system instituted uh, in Gloucester County as, as a pilot to see how, how, how it could be run on a county basis instead of a municipal basis. And it had the certain years they were gonna, it was going to be in effect and that was going to be evaluated. Now, it has not been evaluated yet, but I think obviously evaluation is going to be very crucial, whether that should be extended to other parts of the state or not, or, or left up to the different counties to decide. But that's the kind of thing I think, again, is very, very important. Uh, if you, if you have the pilot study, but also you do have uh, a very critical evaluation. And I would just go back to charter schools. Um, charter schools first started, they were very controversial. They're so controversial. And, and I think as we've gone by, there's really been no fine tuning to the, the charter school uh, legislation. You know, I believe this has to, be, has to be looked at and changed or revised in some ways. But again, that's, that's had like a 15 year period of, of study. And there are some problems, and they, that needs to be addressed. So we're embarking on a very important issue of evaluation in the classroom, and evaluation of teachers. Um, my uh, my son is in the military. His his, uh, his wife is a teacher in Arizona, and she participated in a three-day conference in uh, Phoenix, where they brought teachers from all over the, the state in to begin to ask them how they should how how they should evaluate their peers. <coughs> I don't know if they're following the model from New Jersey or what they're doing, but I mean, this movement obviously is one from state to state. But I, I think it's very, very important. Whatever, whatever model we set up, whatever pilot options we have, we have, we have to evaluate them very seriously. Uh, and just don't say, you know, you have to do this particular one. Thank you. Let me come back to you uh, as the lucky you, the one Republican on the panel. Um, but, but speaking, you, you raised the issue of funding, and, and, it, and it speaks to everybody out here as well, the principals who have to do this job. Um, you know, the capacity issues. Uh, we've, we're asking principals to do more and more. Um, this is where the bullying fits in as well, but uh, they're, obviously their jobs are, are being stretched more and more, and there'll be more evaluations, more observations. At the same time, the funding is largely being, or at least has been cut back over the last few years, where often the first cuts come in administration. So there's fewer folks to do these jobs. You know, you're, you were, you're representing the governor here, lucky you. Um, but, but, speak to, uh, but, but speak to the funding issues and, and, the, and the resources given to do, um, you know, which is a pretty robust system. And I, I'd like to hear the, the Democrats as well as uh, Dr. Baker speak on this issue as well. Do I get the opportunity to choose which of the ten words I can use to describe people? <laughs> no, no, no. no. Um, look, I, I think one of the most significant things the legislature has done in the past several years, and I'm sure we all may have differences, are the caps, the 2% caps. You may not agree with that, but I think it's very important for the schools, for the towns, and also for the counties. However, I have to say, there were two, there were two towns in the entire state uh, this past year. There were, I think there were 14 voted to exceed the cap. Only two of them did. One was my town, where I live. They exceeded the cap by 6%. Taxes went up 24%. People uh, were told, uh, you, you know, you're going to lay off people, blah, blah, blah. No one got laid off, but the taxes went up. Now people are upset that the taxes went up, and they're going to lay off people, which they were not going to do originally. But the, but the point is, taxes still are up 24%. Um, the, in the rest of the state, people decided not to vote to increase their uh, above the 2% cap. And that was an option that the local people had, where I happen to live, Maybe about, by a difference of about maybe uh, 100 votes or so, people decided to exceed the cap, and the rest of the people have to live with that. Um, as a Republican in a democratically uh, controlled legislature, 
with a Republican governor, I don't have too much input in what's going on in anything. I just get reports and I listen to my friends over here because they, they talk to the Department of Ed and those kind of things. But I think in terms of, of the funding, obviously this year uh, there was an increase in the funding or leveling out of funding from folks who really did get as much as they got in the previous years. I'm not on the budget committee as it was in the past. Um, but, I, but, I, but I really think that uh, you know, adult tightening is obviously very, very important, but also having a commitment to, to provide the, ki the kind of services and programs for children is equally important. And most, most communities have found a way to do that. I, I really feel that uh, I don't think any of us has a magic bullet in terms of, uh, you know, where are, we gonna, where are we gonna get the money from to provide for education? Now, a year or so ago, the big issue was there was, a, there was a, almost a billion dollars missing because of uh, the money that was provided from the stimulus. That just wasn't there. So how do you make up, how do you make up for that, that money that was there for two years and then wasn't there? Obviously, some programs had to be cut. And I think that those are the hard choices that, that legislators have to make and citizens have to make and you and the schools have to make. You know, what do you do with the non money that you do have coming in? What, what, are, what are your own priorities? What, what do you feel has to be done? What, what could be put off till later? What could be scaled back? Uh, it, it's difficult for me because I have the same questions asked of me as a legislator from the school districts I represent. Uh, from the principals in the, schools, in the school districts I represent, they ask the same questions. It's very, very difficult. And I, I don't have the answer to all those issues. Senator Ruiz, you are on the budget committee. Um, can, and I'm not even talking about training teachers, and, and obviously those are all uh, costs as well, but do you feel that, that a robust and intelligent, sophisticated evaluation system can happen without additional resources and manpower even uh, to make it happen? No, it's clear in the bill. I, I, I point to the Department of Education to, to fund those uh, uh, programs, and even as of yesterday when we had the acting commissioner of education and we were going uh, across the board with different initiatives. I mean, we obviously saw that there was a grant program that was put in place to test pilot the um, evaluation piece. Uh, next year, there were, there's money within the budget to do the same thing, the expansion. So there is a clear uh, cognizant knowledge that there is money that is required to embark on these initiatives. In some districts, it may mean that there's reallocation of funds. In other districts, it will mean a direct line item to secure that. A another piece uh, to this also is that it's not only the, ev see, the evaluation becomes a marketing tool, so it's not only to develop the evaluation piece, but it's all the other pieces that come out of it. And so when there are I opportunities that are signaled as deficiencies, that we have to support the, uh, professional, the, the professional development plan that will ensure growth, and that too will require Funding. I wanted to ask Dr. Baker, because you looked at other states, is much money being attached to this elsewhere? Um, is that, that an issue? I mean, that's, that's hard to say. I mean, and we're also talking about it at two levels here. Um, one is departmental capacity, which is what I heard um, Senator Reed speak primarily to. But there's also this kind of on the ground capacity in the schools and districts of having, of having the personnel, the principals, and supervisors available to dedicate the amount of time that needs to be dedicated to doing the extent of observation, or even having to release time, re rethinking how we use teaching personnel to restructure, you know, lead teacher assignments to be involved in peer assistance and review the other types of methods that we might want to use to really enrich these personnel evaluation processes. You know, it's a management problem. It's a management problem that you know does make us rethink a little bit about how you know how we use personnel in schools, but probably in a way that substantively adds to costs, not just at the department kind of technical capacity level but also at the school and district level. I, I kind of add as a side piece, I mean, you know, the states have, across the board, been going through their, their various kind of dips and ebbs and flows in, in their budgets. And, but states are also starting from very different points. So when, when New Jersey, which is a reasonably well-funded state that has targeted money to hire need districts, takes a dip or a hit, that's actually you know, less bad, it's hard to say to a New Jersey audience, than when it happens in New York State with a higher need districts have been systematically deprived for decades, um, and where the cuts have actually been levied in larger amounts per pupil to the higher need districts uh, in, in each of the subsequent years, or in Connecticut, where they've effectively gotten nothing, and Bridgeport and, and uh, other districts like that have also never seen substantial resource infusion to begin with. So 
Yeah, another just kind of one point I want to tag on to the end because the cap question came up. You know, it's questionable whether or not the uh, you know, revenues may have lagged during this time period, whether whether capped or not. I think it, an issue to consider in the long term, though, is that teacher quality in the aggregate, the type of people who enter into the teaching profession, is driven largely by the, the overall competitiveness of teaching compensation packages relative to other opportunities. Um, there's actually research out there that shows potential danger to long-run imposition of strict caps, um, usually the constitutional limitation. Um, in driving down the, the quality of applicants to the teacher profession through the function of driving down the competitiveness of, of wages. Secondarily, where caps are overridable um, in the long term, not in a two or three year period, as, as we've been seeing in this short term, which may have slowed growth regardless of the caps, um, but where there is this differentiated ability to override the caps, we're likely to see greater equity concerns. In teacher quality equity across districts which is the much bigger issue than between schools within districts. Um, teacher quality equity is driven by the mix of working conditions and available salaries to compensate those working conditions, for example, between Newark and East Orange versus Essex Fells and West Essex. Um, and we need to be cognizant of you know, how these differential abilities to, to override caps affect <coughs> differential relatives or how it kind of erodes equity over time and how we may ultimately level down the overall wages of the workforce in ways that are disadvantageous to uh, teacher quality in general. So. Let me, uh, we're, we're getting some questions, but I want to get into, because time is uh, of the essence, but I want to get into the issue of the tenure reform. And, and I did this last year, and the Senator uh, died and um, beat me to it a little bit, but I asked all the panelists, will tenure reform happen in 2011? Uh, and he said no, and he wins, because it didn't happen. <laughs> um, but we're in 2012, and I, I do want to go down the table. Um, not only will tenure reform happen, but define it for me uh, a little bit, what, in what form. Uh, let me start with you know, the person whose name is on the bill, uh, Senator Ruiz. Do you think this will happen in 2012, and in what form? Specifically? What well, yeah. Detail. Well, you're, I mean, I'll ask, do you think your bill, as it currently constitutes, will, will be signed into law in 2012? So let me start with a, a, an absolute yes that it will happen. I, to tell you that the uh, Teach New Jersey will be the, the bill that gets signed is, I'm, I'm sure, not the case. We saw that when I first introduced the bill, there has been several changes through um, stakeholder conversations. After the last hearing on the bill that we had, there will be pieces that are moving parts. And, and, and part of this whole open dialogue is to obviously look at the bill and see where there are opportunities of growth, where there are areas for consensus building, um, and where there are needs of improvement that have to be changed. So it will, it will change to some extent, but I think that the uh, intent of the bill, the uh, the time frames of the bill as far as um, a bill that, that, that secures the professional throughout their career span stays, um, the built-in uh, mentorship piece in there, the professional development story that lies within there all stays. Some of the other pieces will move and change um, after uh, conversations continue until we actually get a bill that gets posted and then signed, but since day one, I've always said, I know where I started at uh, this point, I know why I'm driven to um, embark on this mission, I need a bill that will get posted, I need a bill that will get support, and I need a bill that will get signed. This is not symbolic for me, this is about real work. Let me ask one specific, because it's sort of the, the overriding piece, where I, and correct me if I'm wrong on the latest version, but basically you would receive tenure um, after three years of positive evaluations and however those are defined, and you would potentially lose it after two years of less positive evaluations. Do you feel that that basic provision will be in this final bill? Some version of that I've heard from stakeholder groups that they would prefer to see the two year go down to one. I've always advocated that this, you know, that time frame should give us an opportunity to indicate if a person's in need of help to give them an opportunity to show growth and then to uh, kind of create that uh, development plan to see if there's opportunities of growth. I mean, things can change. For me to sit here and say, no, this is exactly what we're going to do, I'm not, I would not be consensus 
builder. I think that from the from the first time that I engaged in this conversation, I told everyone that I would not be having conversations in a vacuum. It would be a very open and public conversation that everyone would have a seat at the table. At the end of the day, we may not disagree on all of, of the moving pieces or what the final construct looks at it, but we've all had an opportunity to share what it is that we believe in and what we think will be the best policy for this. I am confident we will have a bill passed both houses of the legislature this year. I have no idea if the government will sign it. They won't answer that question. Uh, <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 You know, to, to talk about tenure and, and to continue to use the term tenure, I like the focus of, uh, of, of the, whole, the whole, the focus of the, of the potential bill to really be to remove non-performing teachers. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to uh, in any way mislead the folks in this room. I am a big advocate of tenure. I think removing tenure would uh, open the teaching profession to political influence as a reason that New Jersey was the second state in the union to have tenure. I can tell you, <laughs> I can tell you in my own hometown, in my own hometown, where folks have run for the Board of Education to get a particular teacher that didn't treat their child properly. Wow. I mean, so that one to me is something we really got to think of. Again, I don't want the Vietnam strategy here. I don't want to destroy the profession under some uh, goal that somehow it's going to save it. So that, that, one's a, that one's a big burden, I mean, to be honest with you. But are we going to have a bill that will pass both the houses of the legislature? It's very complicated. Senator Wolf? I'm very flattered that I'm speaking for the governor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just making things I'd like to say. Okay. <laughs> But uh, I, I was talking to John before we began. I said, look, I, I will, I'm, I'm speaking personally. I'm not speaking as a Republican or as, you know, the governor's spokesman. This is my own, own personal feelings. I would hope, and I, I'm looking forward to a tenure bill this year. Can we do that? However, as I said before, being a, a, a minority member of the legislature, that is, that is dependent on my chairman right here, if he wants to bring before our committee. Because we've had several meetings, we haven't really passed a lot of meaningful bills this year. We kind of we, we met to met. I mean, we met to meet, right? Correct. Okay. However, um, to me, the most important thing is whatever the tenure bill is that the individual being evaluated has knowledge of what it is that they're doing that is incorrect, and that a plan be worked out that they know what they must do to correct that. Otherwise, I don't really see how tenure can be effective if you're going to evaluate somebody and say you haven't done your job because. I'm sure we all, and I just want to leave my last example as Pat has said. Uh, I work in a college, and when I first worked at my college, there was an individual who had tenure, who had been there for a long time, taught history, and he read from the textbook for 75 minutes, twice a week. That was his course. He, bought, he, he signed up for the course, he came in his classroom, he, he stood at a lectern, and he opened up the textbook, said, We're going to be on page 415. He, he just read. No questions, nothing. He had tenure. I think he finally retired. So, I mean, I'm sure you all have examples, maybe not that bad, or maybe a little bit different. So again, I think the person, in all fairness, has to know what, what, are, what are their shortcomings, what is expected of them to be able to improve, and is there a plan that's worked out for them to follow? And if they don't do it, they're gone. Right? So, everyone, Casey? Um, yes, for all the reasons already uh, given. And I wanted to throw something in. I wanted to make a comment uh, on the last thing we were talking about, and that is getting back to the capacity issue and administration. Um, I'm, I, I have an idea. I don't know how well it would work, but I would love for perhaps this group to take up this idea. And that is to think about um, reorganizing our schools in terms of what the principal's role is. I happen to think or I have the sense that um, uh, superintendents as well as principals are expected to be everything. Uh, the principal is supposed to be the, um, you know, the curriculum leader in the building, the evaluator, 
but also make sure that the heat is on and the windows are clean and you know there's so many different things that we expect of you that I I don't think that it's reasonable because I think the people have different strengths and interests um, so I'm wondering if we might not step back and take a look at here's here's a novel idea um, there are some charter schools that do this very differently and um, we're not going to talk about charter schools today but I agree with Assemblyman Wolf that we absolutely need to go back and, and look at re review and revise the original law but um, one model that we might look at that has some some history is that in a lot of charter schools you have the school leader who is all about curriculum and instruction and then you have an operations person who takes care of all those other details in terms of running the building because when we talk about demands on your time as principals I there just aren't enough hours in the day I don't know of any principals whom I respect and, and who run really good buildings who don't practically live there. And I think that's unreasonable, especially in terms of salary caps and uh, salary limitations. So that's one idea. The other idea is the idea of caps on superintendent salaries. I think we really need to be looking at that um, because while the governor may disagree, my, what I'm hearing is that we are experiencing a drain. Um, I know in my own district we have a fantastic superintendent and when his, when his uh, uh, contract runs out, there's no way we're going to be able to keep him with these salary caps that are in place. And he will be in great demand because of the accomplishments. And he represents um, a number of professionals in the field who will be impacted in the same way. And we are losing people daily to New York and Connecticut. Um, and if yes, uh, the administrators that remain, will they be able to accomplish all the state mandated tasks? Speak of how your bill um, addresses who plays what role in the school on some of these decisions. The, the intent uh, of the bill, and this is a discussion I've had with your advocacy group on, on making some tweaks and changes before we see a final product, is to ensure that you have the flexibility to assemble the most key staff that it would be critical to ensuring success within your building. If you are the one who is going to be held accountable of what's happening there, then you should be given the resources to um, structure uh, your, your, your workforce. The school improvement panel is uh, a support system in the sense that it's like, you know, several CEOs and board members to be part of that process. From what I've heard from practitioners is that that already oftentimes happens. When a teacher is getting, um, uh, a teacher or anyone who's going to join the staff in a school, that principals will bring in other practitioners to just be part of the interview process to see um, what their opinions are. At the end of the day, the way it's structured in the bill, it's the principal who makes the final decision. And, and no one trusts that. That's how the bill is structured today. I would, I would actually point out that I mean, the, the, this, this, is a, this is a piece of kind of a component of legislation that's floated across a number of states under the same of mutual consent policies and type of this kind of removing seniority privileges. I mean, and it does kind of, it falsely assumes that bad decisions are only made centrally in good decisions at the school level. <laughs> um, it ignores the fact that district officials still have the latitude to assign the principal. Uh, it permits a scenario where a weak principal running a bad school, running it badly, can actually deny the assignment of a good teacher who the central office believes might actually change what's going on. There. And most importantly to me as a researcher, the one place where this has been studied longitudinally, the, the, the name of the district was masked, I would be discussing it for the paper at, at an academic conference that looked at, it was intentional, originally these policies were designed not to deal with issues like the New York City rubber room thing, which became a big news story, but it was this question of, the distribution of equitable teaching qualifications across kid, kids across schools within a large urban district, and was it that the senior teachers were gaming their way into the more desirable school through a preference-based policy, and, and could principal control over those decisions mitigate that to some extent? So it was studied longitudinally in this 
Seattle decentralization plan, and it was actually found that in the short term, the removal of the seniority preferences coupled with a requirement of mutual consent led to less equity in the distribution of teachers by their qualifications across settings um, by seniority and degree level and kind of typical <coughs> factors. Um, and in the end, it kind of evolved back to about the same as it was to begin with. Um, and there are a number of factors that play into this. Um, you know, one is that it, it gave opportunity for teachers who had been stuck in the harder to ta staff schools with five to ten years experience to jump more quickly into what they perceived as more desirable settings. And, and this is in the context of a very large urban in Seattle. So it's a large, complex, racially and ethnically diverse district where you know, it just proved to really not accomplish much of anything except to create this kind of weird management constraint tension between central administration and the principals and an awkward short-term pattern of mobility of teachers. So I, I think it's, this is just one of those policies that's been kind of a, a weird kind of thorn in my side to watch happen over time. One of the areas of my own research does study um, principals' role in teacher selection and distribu distribution of principal equity across schools is a huge issue. Assuming that granting latit more latitude to principals across schools is going to improve the distribution of teaching equity is likely a false assumption because of the inequity of distribution of principal quality and qualifications across schools. So I, I just think that this is this would be one piece of the policy that I'd be happy to talk in much greater detail about. But I think it's I just think it's a piece that can easily go because I can't find any reasonable justification for it. So we have some more questions. We have some more questions um, that deal with a, a, a number of things. Uh, one of them being for Dr. Baker, and I'm not. I'm going to let him follow off, off camera. But uh, one is, what is higher ed doing to ensure uh, that teachers and, and principals are, are coming in with these skills? But alas, we've run out of time. Um, so um, so we can leave that one hanging out there. But I want to thank the panelists uh, for taking the time. Takeaway, it seems that uh, there is some optimism in the room, um, but exactly what's there.